if everyone can put on the camera please we can have a kind of a screenshot for uh, because in the last we generally <laughs> forget to take that so if you, if every uh, i request everyone to put on the camera very fast please thank you payal thank you sneha monica oh nice to see faces but yeah nice everybody yeah we're missing vaishali <laughs> Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Hi. Good evening, mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Melissa, if you are there, please take the screenshot. Rekha, if you are there, please take the screenshot. Vaishali, you can take even. I took a couple. Shubhra, if you can uh, mute yourself, please. Rima, you too. There's little disturbance. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so it's it's six right now here, and I think we should start. Uh, so, uh, greetings and welcome to GD Goenka Learn Academy in association with GD Goenka University. I'm super thrilled and excited sharing this space with all of you. My name is Dr. Abha Sharma and I'm heading School of Education, GD Goenka University, Gurgaon. I thank you all for taking your time to participate in this webinar on Communities of Practice for Teachers from Webheads in Action to Electronic Village Online Minecraft Book. We will be recording the presentation as usual and would be posting the link on GD Goenka School of Education Facebook page. For the Q&A session, you are requested to post the questions in the comment box. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce you to Mr. Vance Stevens. He is the founder coordinator of WebEds in Action and LearningTogether.net. He has produced over 500 podcast episodes since 2010. He has been on the internet section editor of Teaching English as Second or a Foreign Language since 2002. Vance has over 150 publications which deals with students using computers to learn languages and teachers learning to teach using technology by engaging in communities of practice and in participatory cultures. He has co-coordinated TESOL Electronic Village Online since 2003 and has co-moderated EVO Minecraft MOOC for the past seven years. He was recently awarded the 2019 Call Research Conference Lifetime Achievement Award. Congratulations and thank you and welcome once to GD Goenka of Learn Academy. We would like to know more about Webheads in Action, an Electronic Village Online Minecraft MOOC. Over to yes, you, Mr. Stevens. Okay, that's what I plan to talk about. Yes. So let's see. Present a tab. There we go. It should work. Okay. You can see me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, I'm just flipping. I, I haven't seen the meet, uh, the meet uh, page. It doesn't show my screen on the on the... It's okay. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> so anyway, well, thank you very much. This is actually uh, episode 516 of Learning Together, learningtogether.net, and I always post my uh, podcasts um, at, that, at that link. And oh, everything I do, I always write up in advance, and the slides that you're looking at now are online. If you want, to, There's a lot of links in them. All the links are live. So if you want to get the slides, they're in a Google Doc. You just go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, slash Vance 2021 Goinka. And uh, that should get you the slides. It's repeated here. So it's uh, mnemonic, bit.ly. Everyone, I think, knows B-I-T dot L-Y. <clears throat> so if you do it, Vance, 21, Vance 2021 Goenka, you get the slides, and if you get if you do it the other way, you forget which is first. Do Goenka 2021 Vance, then you'll come out on a an article I kind of wrote for this, so to get my thoughts together. And there's a link from one to the other, so you can't get lost. Okay, let's see. What are we going to talk about today? 
Oh, here's a few things. I just there's a nice link for this uh, word cloud if you're looking for a word cloud. I, I, word clouds used to be harder, easier to come by than they are now. But anyway, oh, that was a nice one. I thought. <clears throat> so, let's see the important things here. I don't know TESOL. Are you familiar with TESOL? Teachers of English to speakers of other languages. And EVO is a uh, Electronic Village Online. That's a, a community of practice I'll be talking about quite a bit. And uh, EVO Minecraft MOOC is one of the um, one of the um, sessions in EVO. And one I've done previously is Multiliteracies, literacies. And Webheads in Action was another. So um, before Webheads in Action, I started something called Writing for Webheads. So that's a little what uh, the things that you see here. We're going to talk about computer-mediated computer communication, CMC, etc. So uh, be, let's see. Okay. So I've been in computing since the late '70s and um, using them to construct uh, call lessons in, uh, you know, for language learners. At that time, uh, well, let's see, that was the late 70s. I went from there to Hawaii, where I got my uh, uh, MA, and I bought an Apple computer. So that was the time when computers, I was working on a mainframe in the 70s in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> and so when I went to Hawaii and got my Apple, that was uh, one of the, that was the, one of the first, that was the first, is somebody talking to me or? Good evening. Uh, Mr. Johnson, please mute. Uh, Vaishali, please mute. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> no problem. Um, anyway, so yeah, the, the Apple computer kind of revolutionized computing because it, um, it put computing power in everybody's um, uh, hands, on everybody's desktop. And anyhow, so uh, I wrote an article called Humanism and Cal, The Coming of Age, because that was about um, um, computers at that time. It was earlier days. They were thought of things to control the learning algorithm or to manage learning in a top-down directed fashion. And it took people a while to come. Uh, my argument was that computers were humanistic, and they weren't, uh, they weren't necessarily, you know, they weren't controlling, they didn't have to be. And back then, there was many people who had this idea that computers were controlling and thought there wasn't much use for them in education uh, because teachers could do a better job. And, well, sure, teachers can, but still, uh, the, the humanistic communicative aspects are, of call are the things that I've been most uh, interested in. Okay, so uh, back in those days, let's see. Uh, I mentioned TESOL, Teachers of Speakers to Other Languages. I mentioned being in uh, Hawaii at the time I got my first Apple, which is the early 80s. Uh, I was invited to a symposium on CAL, which is Computer Assisted Language Learning, in Toronto uh, while I was there at the uh, University of Hawaii. <clears throat> and we started at TESOL an interest section on computer-assisted language learning. And I wrote about how that came about at, uh, in this link. All the links are, of course, uh, oops, sorry, OK. All the links are viable. You can read the articles. The articles are all online, full text. So if you're interested in anything, you can, you can uh, read more about these things. But we set up this interest section, and we met at TESOL conferences and we started something called a hospitality room to try to get people to understand how computers could be useful in language learning. We were all completely committed to that idea. Those of us in Cal IS. And um, in, I think, about 1997, let's see, we, we uh, started, we, we called our hospitality room an electronic village. And here's a linked to a 2004 photo of us in the electronic village. I think that, in that particular one, we're using webcams to communicate with people outside. It, it basically, the electronic village, just so you can picture it, is a bunch of computers all over the place. 
and a bunch of people who come there and they might share software or they might rummage in boxes and find software they can look at or you know they talk and they give presentations so um, the electronic village uh, this one is in 2004 which you're seeing right there by then uh, the electronic village had set up a the Cal IS interest section had set up a part of electronic village which they call um, the electronic village online and we used to all meet face to face in this room, uh, something like that. You know, at, at each conference, each big conference, and Electronic Village Online was a really nice idea to get people to meet before the conferences. The conferences are always in uh, uh, March or maybe April, and um, we um, so. The Electronic Village Online was a way to get people uh, to start sessions. People volunteered to uh, present sessions. That is, they have something to share or to, uh, to teach. They'll offer a session. People can enroll in the session. It's all free. <clears throat> you can enroll in these sessions. It makes a huge, a great community of practice. The link is evosessions.pbworks.com. And the page I've got up right now is the one that we are setting up for the 2022 uh, EVO sessions. So we will put out a call for participation in, uh, I think it's in uh, July or something like that. Yes. And uh, meanwhile, we behind the scenes are organizing our next sessions. We're taking proposals and we're getting ready for you if you'd like to join us. So that's 2001, and if I back up just a little bit to 1998, I had uh, started something called Writing for Webheads. Writing for Webheads was a, it was a, actually at the time in, in that year, I had gone to California to work in a software company to produce educational software, um, speech recognition software, for example. <clears throat> I was working at the company, and I had been teaching for 15 years by then, and I had missed teaching. So I wanted to get stay involved in teaching. So somebody there named Dave Wynette had uh, started a website, which he called study.com, and uh, he was getting teachers to propose courses, and uh, students would come and take the courses. So the course I was, I had volunteered to teach was called was writing and grammar so um, I got I organized this course well actually um, first of all I learned that anybody who came to the course they, they joined by email uh, they were not interested in writing or grammar they were interested in socializing they were interested in talking to one another communicating uh, eventually we started meeting in a uh, um, multi-user virtual environment called uh, the palace and we found like-minded people who just wanted to come and talk we sort of dispelled the notion of teaching anything we dealt with people who wanted to learn we created an area for them to go and learn and um, I, I didn't really have a syllabus because no one was interested uh, I got people to write about themselves. I got people to contribute photographs, and you can see uh, I started putting these photographs online. It was hard at that time to get people to send photographs. They were suspicious, but uh, they soon, once we opened up the gates, they just put photographs in. Now, that was in 1998. This was going on. We, we attracted t teachers to this, and the teachers uh, were really there to meet with the students. <clears throat> and to join us, join our conversations, just interact with the students, learn how it worked. And in 2002, this is one year after EVO was started, in 2001, uh, I, they asked me actually to do a session for teachers about how that happened. So it basically was a session m where I modeled how we had set up web, uh, writing for web heads. And all these links are live, all these pictures are there still. So um, 
we did that in 2002. It just took off like crazy. It was, people loved it. Uh, we, people are waiting for these opportunities to get together and uh, learn online. Um, and we started getting interested in the idea of a community of practice because we were learning that we were we were thinking we were a community of practice. So in 2003, I shifted the focus of a study of whether we were a community of practice or not. And this didn't. This is kind of like teaching students writing and grammar. They didn't really come there for the writing and grammar. The people here in the, in the web heads in action didn't really come there to learn about communities and practice. It was, you know, they were, we were interested because that was us. We went to Baltimore, the TESOL conference that year. Um, we um, uh, gave workshops, made some really nice presentations, but the um, the community took off in a slightly different direction. See, first of all, let's talk about what a, what community communities of practice are. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Lav, Jean Lav, and Etienne Wenger. In 1991, they wrote a book called Situated Learning, and what they had done, they were employed to study how uh, I think it was a, I think it was in Xerox how Japanese employees I think uh, organized themselves in the workshops and how they communicated they studied how they communicated um, in ways that were really a, a community of practice but what, what you have to understand is they say they coined the term and that they they made the term up. But what they were studying was apprenticeship relationships, or what they call situated learning, where you learn in the situation. And uh, apprentices are, have been with us since medieval times, before probably. Uh, they're people who learn from others in the community. <clears throat> so an apprentice, uh, someone who learns in an apprentice fashion, probably doesn't get a manual or a book. They just kind of follow the model of the the master. So this this graphic right here, which I found at that website that I've just linked there, uh, defines communities of practice as groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. Now that, there are three elements in there uh, important to Etienne Wenger's uh, principles of a community of practice. One is you have a shared domain. That is, you, you're, you're talking about something and you want to learn how to practice that, how to do it better, and you do it through a community approach. So the first communities of practice were studied, uh, I think, at Xerox plants, but eventually, about the time we're talking about here, uh, Wenger wrote a book about distributed communities of practice, realizing that uh, this kind of thing was applicable online. So meanwhile, back at the Webheads in Action, so we started in 2002. We started looking at communities of practice, or at least I did, 2003. By 2004, some of these people decided to start something called Becoming a Webhead. They made it an EVO session, and they did this for 10 years. The really interesting thing about this is they took, they perpetuated the community of practice because the people who were interested in this, they they wanted to uh, interact regularly about their domain, which was how to learn how to communicate with students online. And um, so they emulated the original model, and they kept it going for 10 years. And when they tired of that, someone else took over. So uh, from 2014 to 2020, another group came along calling themselves ICT for ELT. Some of the same people who had been through the Webheads in Action communities of practice. What I'm saying here is that this is a community of practice in operation. The people are the same. The domain is the same. The uh, the community is pretty much the same. And um, so you know, they're they're um, it's a good illustration, I think, of, of a community of practice. Okay, so. Um, these groups, web, Writing for Webheads, Webheads in Action, Becoming a Webhead, I, ICT for ELT, they're all built on uh, communities of practice 
Web 2.0 and computer mediated communication. So what I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Web 2.0. My first writing for Webhead's website was a Web 1.0 site. I had to take the posts, put them online, take the student writing, put it all up there. You can see all that if you want. If you go and visit the the site that I showed you, um, so you can see what they wrote. You can see how we interacted with each other. Um, but basically, we were going to TESOL conferences and involving other teachers in these computer media communications tools. Um, so this one is from TESOL 2005. And you can go there to learn more about some of the... I, I actually use this as an example of where you could go there to see what tools we were using in 2005. Okay, so meanwhile, 2004, uh, George Siemens wrote something that I don't think any of us had really read by then, but he wrote about connectivism. Connectivism, is, he called it a learning theory for the digital age. And what it means is that, uh, he put it very nicely in his article, he said that the pipes are more important than the content of the pipes, the pipes themselves. In other words, what that means is that we learn in, con in a connected fashion. We connect to one another and learn that way. And... Um, if you've got your pipes working, your connections to other people working, then it doesn't really matter what's in the pipes. You're going to get it because the most important thing is the pipes working so you can go from your network into someone else's network and pick up something. And if you ask a question, they might know someone somewhere else along the line that has an answer. So this was all really nice stuff in 2004. Uh, in 2008, Something the Big Bang happened in uh, in MOOCs. MOOCs came along. Uh, the way that happened was that uh, George Siemens, who wrote about connectivism, and Stephen Downs uh, worked with him, put on a um, a course in a Canadian university, and the course was for people who had paid to do it. And they had maybe 25, 30 people in the course. Um, you know, they were enrolled in the in the course, but they thought through what they believed in was connectivism, that people that the, the people in the course would benefit from the network. So they opened the course up to um, anybody who wanted to join. And how many people would join such a course, do you think? Maybe a hundred, a thousand? It was more like two or three thousand. So they had thousands of people who wanted to take this course and just interact with it. And they made clear that they were only going to pay attention to the people who had were in the university program because that's what they had enrolled in. But they had to come up with a way of managing um, the learning for all the other people. And the things they came up with on the fly, uh, like Stephen Downs made a, a website for it that aggregated content. So if someone posted a blog post, everyone could see it or there was a connection to it. Um, so there was a lot of information in the network that didn't have to be monitored top-down. This, this uh, way of learning was just massive. Um, meanwhile, these two guys pictured at the bottom, Peter Norvig and Sebastian Thruen, uh, professors at Stanford, decided to use the same, a similar model, I should say, to put a course on artificial intelligence online. And their idea was to um, create the course, let anyone enroll for free, but run it through algorithms. So people had to follow a uh, path through the course, and they, and they had to take evaluations. And if they succeeded, they would get a certificate, just like the, at a regular Stanford course. So um, Sebastian Thun, Thun went on to, uh, he, started, he, he quit Stanford. He went to work for Google. You think it was a good job? He quit that. He started a company called Udacity, uh, and uh, I believe he was joined by Peter Norvig. Uh, there were other uh, similar um, entities. One was edX. edX was also one where it wasn't a connectivist MOOC. It was what George Siemens called a, an X MOOC. So there are two distinct kinds of MOOCs. It's important that you understand that if you're talking about uh, getting involved in MOOCs. Which do you prefer? Do you prefer a, an X MOOC or a C MOOC? 
An XMOOC is, well, as Siemens put it, XMOOCs are about knowledge replication, whereas CMOOCs are about knowledge creation. So an XMOOC is structured where you can uh, you get people to pick up the knowledge algorithmically. CMOOCs are about getting the knowledge through the network, through each other, through connectivism. So an XMOOC is typically more a linear prescribed fashion uh, to address a, a predetermined skill set, whereas CMOOCs would take place when you want to negotiate knowledge with other people. And also, if you want to just test and see what you can learn at a place, you can get involved in a CMOOC. George Siemens used to say that he had uh, lecture halls full of students. He didn't really know why they were there or what they needed. And so an XMOOC or this one-size-fits-all way of addressing this lecture hall full of people was inadequate. Uh, he needed something where individuals could find their own way. In fact, he said that if he showed a learner the way, that he would eviscerate their learning experience. Uh, he said he didn't know of any body of knowledge or any research that suggested or indicated to him that you really had to follow a set prescribed path of knowledge, that learning in your own way was fine uh, for certain things. But in this case, of course, the learners have to define their own needs, set their own goals, their own pace of learning. Uh, they learn by interacting with each, with each other. They might uh, have to self-assess themselves, or they might assess each other. Um, Anyway, uh, and, and what they'll do is they'll make connections that will generate discourse arguments and address their shared goals. Uh, one little thing, I've got a, 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 a citation for Siemens there, but he worked in a place he called eLearn Space, and it's really hard to find his work now because eLearn Space disappeared. So sometimes you have to Google creatively to, to get to these places. Okay, so what does, what would you, what's a, a CMOOC good for? Here's a guy named Dave Snowden who uh, ha has a company that um, advises people on how to address complicated problems. And um, <clears throat> he, he's, uh, he created the Cinephine model, and there are four areas of learning here. So if you start with a lower right, there's obvious learning. There is, if you want someone to conjugate verbs, you can show them the verb chart, get them to memorize it. It works. You can test them on it later. They'll probably do well. They might do well in the test, but then if you take them into a more complicated, complex, or heaven forbid, chaotic situation, they're just going to lose. They're not going to be able to speak that language at all. Uh, Complicated means that there are known unknowns. Um, so it's not quite as straightforward as, uh, uh, as obvious, but we're here in this area where XMOOCs could help. But if you, once you get into complex, where there are unknown unknowns, then um, you have to sense and respond and continually test your waters, and uh, it, to do that, a CMOOC starts getting worth examining, and then if you go into chaotic, chaotic is where there's a plane crash, you know, and, uh, you know, it's hard to advise people exactly what to do, but people have to sort of act, sense, respond, um, and in the middle is disorder. And, oh, another thing about the Kennedy model is that if you start with the obvious and then plunge into the chaotic, some of these uh, diagrams have a deep line here. He called it a, a cliff. If you go from obvious to chaotic, that is anathema. You have to progress around this diagram if you want to. But, and and CMOOCs are good for that kind of thing. Okay, so Dave Cormier, did I mention that he... He, he worked with uh, Stephen Downs and George Siemens in his first um, in their first MOOC in 2008. He gave it the name 
he said they didn't really have a name for it when they started. So he said, oh, there's a massive open online course. It's a lot of people in it. It's open. That means it's, it's, it's not behind a paywall. It's online and it's a course. How do you, and, and MOOCs can be very disorienting, actually. Uh, people often ask about a MOOC, where is the center? Um, so how do we, Dave, Dave wrote a lovely, made a lovely video here, it's well worth watching, just five or six minutes. And he said there are five steps for getting involved in a MOOC. I've used this in the MOOCs I've created, I guess starting with Multimic, well, uh, yeah, Webheads in Action, you know, since, but later on, Multimook, um, EVO Minecraft MOOC. You, you start with um, orientation. If you go to the course, you have to figure out what it's about because it, it may not be all laid out. Now, I always create a syllabus for my courses, but I understand that when you get into the course, people might not follow the syllabus because they're, if it's structured in a way that is for them, that they can learn what they want to learn, they might find the syllabus, syllabus is good for orientation. But basically what they do, uh, sometimes I spend a week on each of these. Uh, the second week, by then, people should start to inform the course, introduce themselves and inform the course, uh, the people in the course, who they are, why they're there. And then people start to get to know who else is there in the environment. And then the network, networking is the third step. That is, some people start connecting with each other. The networks could be within the course itself or they could go beyond the course. That's what... Uh, Downs and Siemens were trying to do in their uh, the CCOK, the CCKK, that's connected uh, knowledge. Uh, anyway, uh, they're their first MOOC. Um, so th the network could be with the people there, or it could be with other people outside the network. So they were trying to bring people into the network so this would happen. Now, these massive courses could have people in many different time zones or uh, people have different interests. People often in, in MOOCs will find their own interest uh, and they, they start clustering. Some people who get along well or have the same interests or up at the same time will cluster together and they'll sort of form pockets. And those pockets can be very productive. I mean, there might be people in other clusters doing completely different things, but if you're learning from your cluster, then You've achieved your goal. And the last step is focus. So focus means that since this is a course, a course is something with a limited time frame, but a MOOC, and a MOOC is a course, so it has a limited time frame, but a network or a personal learning network doesn't have to end. So there could be life after your, once you've clustered and learned something, you might find projects to focus on. This often happens. Uh, we say that the, one of the great takeaways of, of a MOOC is the network. So, so I started in 2004. Uh, the TESOL asked me to put on an, a course for them called Multiliteracies. And so I did this course in 2000. By the way, if you click on any of these links, you'll go to the portal for the course in that year. So you can see all the content there and who is there and the things they did, the things we left online. So the first few years I did Multiliteracies, I did it for 10 years. And the first few years, I did it as a TESOL uh, Principles and Practices of Online Teaching uh, course. And this course was run in Desire to Learn. Uh, I used Desire to Learn mainly to, um, for the forums. Uh, when I had content, I would put it somewhere else and I would connect to it through Desire to Learn. Um, I used Blackboard the same way, usually. So anyway, by 2009, I started this as an EVO course. So to keep it alive in my mind and, and to keep it viable, I ran it twice a year, once as this course in Desire to Learn, but then a second time as a more open uh, crucible of what I wanted to do in the course. Then I, I ran it again as an EVO session and a TESOL session in 2000. 10. In 2011, the same again. Okay, so I ran them both at the same time. I think the TESOL people were being, beginning to think I wasn't really creating the materials and desire to learn for them by then. 
Uh, but by 2012, I went into, um, I, I started, I, I started looking, I started doing the multiple literacies with really uh, looking at MOOCs and, uh, and connectivism. And by 2013, I had started calling the course MultiMOOC. And uh, 2014 was the last time. So if you want to see that material, you can go to any link on that slide. It will take you to the, the thing you're looking for. OK, so I keep coming back to Dave Cormier. He also ran MOOCs, very interesting MOOCs, connective as MOOCs. And one of his, uh, uh, one of the things he used to write about was rhizomatic education. CAC means communities, uh, the community as curriculum. If you go back to Wenger, and you, we talked about situated learning and how in the apprentice model, you're learning from the community. And what Dave decided to do in 2015 was start a course where he got it going, and then he's just kind of invited the community to set the curriculum, or to be the curriculum, not to set it, to be it, to, to, to actually be there and do what the people wanted to do. And I was doing the same pretty much in my uh, multi MOOC courses. I had a syllabus, as I, I mentioned. I, I think it's I think you should start one so that people can orient on it. But don't be disappointed if people don't follow it. If what you're looking for is a connectivist experience. So um, anyway, you can read more about uh, his rhizomatic model and the community as curriculum in some of these uh, links here. OK, so the uh, Love and Wenger, who coined the term community of practice, studying apprenticeships as learning models, the term community of practice referred to the community that acts as a living curriculum. So the question I've been raising here is if the community is a, a curriculum, then where is the syllabus? Okay, so now, and I, we've, we've looked at uh, Stoden's Kinefin model, and we've seen how CMOOCs, connectivist MOOCs, address certain ways of learning when you're trying to explore. Uh, what you're trying to do. So in 2014, I left uh, Molten MOOC behind, and I started into EVO Minecraft MOOC. Now, Minecraft is, some, is a conundrum in search of a community. Um, my problem with Minecraft was that I had been, it, it was developed in 2009. It was being used by educators in 2009. It was released in 2011. And it was very popular with uh, people doing educational podcasts who were realizing that their students um, liked Minecraft. I had one, one person who did a, uh, ran a, a, worked at a secondary school in uh, Dubai, noticed that her students were going to Minecraft during breaks. And she went over and saw what they were doing. And they said, can we play Minecraft in class? And she said, I don't think so. Uh, they said, oh, but we could use it this way in class. And she said, well, I have a syllabus I have to cover. I have a curriculum I have to meet. I have goals. I have objectives. What you do, you write me how we can use this game in our class, and we'll do it. And that's what she did. So the students, they kind of became the curriculum in a way. You know, they, they wrote out, they, they helped her justify how she could use Minecraft in their curriculum. You don't use it all the time. You use it for certain things. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about that in a, a little bit. So if you want to join Minecraft book, this is from the last year. We've done it for seven years. So the last year was just the one just, the January just passed. And you can find it at, uh, minecraftmook.org, which also actually takes you to um, uh, missionsforminecraft.pbworks.com. Okay, so, um, as with MultiMook, I also archive all the previous uh, sessions of our EVO Minecraft MOOCs. And they're very interesting because we do a lot of recordings. We record ourselves in Minecraft. We gather a lot of data about what people are doing with it. 
we show how we interact with each other. Minecraft is something that um, you have to do it in order to understand it. It's got a participatory culture behind it. It's not something that you can be told how to do and then you go and do that. I had a, a teaching colleague who um, I, I installed Minecraft in our computer lab and she asked me, oh, I hear you've put Minecraft in the computer lab. I said, yes, I have. And she says, oh, can I take my students down there next period? Nice question, but the answer really is I don't think so because in order to <laughs> get anywhere with your students, you can't know you have to know what you're doing. You have to go on there yourself. I was actually trying to implement it at that uh, institution by getting people to come down. I put it there for actually for the teachers to come down and play with it. I was using it with my own students. Anyway, um, so let's see. That's the link to the Minecraft.org. Both of those take you to the Missions from Minecraft portal page. So how we began in, uh, I was following Minecraft, trying to figure out a way to get into it. I couldn't work my way in because most of the, it needs a community. Most of the communities had students in them. Students were not, uh, communities with teachers and their students were not interested in um, allowing another adult to come and interact with their students. It, would not make a kid safe space or potentially not kid safe space. So it's very hard. It was very hard at the beginning to get in with uh, Minecraft. So I had a colleague in uh, Webheads actually. Her name is Marianne Schmolchitz, and that's her son Philip there. I think he was 10 or 11 when that picture was taken. He was telling a um, something called the Reform Symposium about using Minecraft. And he became fluent in Minecraft. Uh, fluent in English, sorry. He, he, his use of Minecraft, where he created his own video channel, he interacted with, he's in Croatia, so he, his lingua franca was always English. So Mariana interviewed him for that article that's written right, right there, Tessel EJ. And you can read that article if you like, it's quite interesting. Uh, I did the research, uh, the background research. I, I, did, I found people who were, other teachers who were using Minecraft. And Having identified them, I asked them if they could, if they wanted to join us. So um, I actually got a lot of uptake. Uh, one guy who joined us was named Jeff Kuhn. Jeff is, uh, he knew a lot about Minecraft. You know, this is a community, a network. So people, uh, many people know a lot about what they're doing. Some people don't know anything. The idea is to scaffold one another, as we, we said, to make a space for teachers to explore them multiplayer game Minecraft as a virtual world for learning and learn to adapt what they learn to their classrooms. So Jeff and I wrote an article about the participatory culture in Minecraft and you can read uh, a, a copy there. And um, Jeff had really nice skills. He, he set up the server for us, our first server. So just using people in the community got ourselves going I didn't know anything about Minecraft. I started learning, and we were some people were learning from scratch. Other people were eager to share their skills. So, um, so let's see. It's hard to explain all that because it's uh, ineffable. You know, so it's ineffable meaning that uh, it's not something you explain. It's something that has to be done in order to under, be understood. But this last TESOL conference, which was an online conference, a virtual conference. I did some presentations on Minecraft and I did something, I, I went into it more deeply uh, than I had done before. I created a couple of videos. The, the more interesting one, I was asked to create a 10 minute version. I created a long version and then reduced that to 20 minutes. But then the long version, what I did is I, I went to the archive of our videos and I took segments of those videos where people were doing interesting things. I got 13 such segments. And I matched those 13 segments with um, some affordances of Minecraft. First of all, where it showed that Minecraft is creative. Everyone is a builder. 
It's fun, uh, gamified to attract play, game-based, these are different things. Gamified means that it uh, has an addictive element. Um, it draws you into doing things and staying in the game, uh, usually, hopefully, learning. And game-based means that it's modifiable by teachers. It's very community-based. Uh, it has extensive networks, resources, YouTube channels, participatory culture where people interact online. If you're teaching English, they, they do that mostly in English. Or if you want to learn another language, there's Minecraft um, teachers and learners in Japanese, Spanish. Um, it encourages communication. Students will narrate what they're doing. They create multimedia productions. They have conversations with teachers and peers. So there's a lot of communication going on. It encourages research. Students are always reading, listening to, or listening to things and then acting on reading or what they listen to, and uh, comprehending videos, very good for pronunciation. In fact, actually, we've learned from uh, that, that one of its benefits was it exposes students to different accents, which apparently was difficult for some people. And another one encourages informal learning. So um, let's see, if I just back up to this previous slide, you can read more information at uh, this top PB Works Wiki, EVO 21 Classics. And at that one, it shows you, it, this is a page from that, this is snippet number eight, in which uh, my wife and I found a treasure map. Um, and we followed the map to find treasure. And so this is one of the many, uh, this, this is map reading skills are one thing. There's trigonometry. We had to triangulate on the space that we wanted to reach in order to follow the map. Um, it's, uh, there's quite a lot of skills used in there, and that's just one of the 13 segments. So they're all described in that, uh, in that web page. So let's see. If you want more inform information on Minecraft and language learning, that place I just pointed you to gives details of those 13 video snippets and how they each illustrate various affordances of Minecraft and language learning. Or you can go to our Missions for Minecraft wiki and go to the pedagogy page where we've listed our um, writings, selected writings from other people. Uh, you can see how EVO Minecraft MOOC participants and other teachers world, worldwide have studied and used Minecraft in their teaching. And so coming down to the end of this, what uh, this is a, a link to an article I wrote in 2010 about shifting sands, shifting paradigms. What, what this is really, what I'm coming to is that educators need to perform a mind shift a paradigm shift. They have to retool themselves into the kind of learner that will benefit from novel modes of learning, and they have to inculcate that mindset through modeling best practices for learning in their students. So in other words, basically, teachers have to become master learners. They have to learn how to learn autonomously and then inculcate that into their students. Otherwise, you're just perpetuating a linear approach to learning. Now, that's not that the linear approach isn't good. That's the second point. There's no real radical break with traditional learning. But you have to be steadily restructuring learning frame frameworks into those that will challenge learners to accept more responsibility for learning what they feel is most relevant to them. So that's what learner autonomy is all about. That's what MOOCs are good for. Educators need to remain open to a variety of possibilities. They need to encourage facilitated over prescriptively directed learning. So they need to encourage the students to find their own ways. And ways forward in that endeavor is to um, involve COPs, MOOCs, and games. Those are the three I've mentioned in this, in this talk, three I've tried to illustrate. So let's see. Uh, I gave a talk at one of the IATEFL conferences um, in 2008 based on a paper I had written in 2007. And this was the conclusion to my talk in 2008. Uh, the slides are there. You can see the slides. And you can also read the, uh, the 
paper that I wrote about uh, autonomous learners. Teachers start with autonomous teachers. If you want autonomous learners, so teachers who practice autonomy in their own professional development formulate heuristics for harvesting knowledge within their personal learning spaces. And that way, they stand a better chance of inculcating the desired behaviors in their students, and that will increase the likelihood of producing potentially autonomous lifelong learners, which is a skill badly needed in the 21st century. And it has to be a percolative process. Uh, Stephen Downs uh, once said, which I thought made a lot of sense at the time, teachers model and demonstrate, learners practice and reflect. Then a guy named David Warlock came along and said, well, he thought teachers had to be master learners. In other words, I, you know, I have said, by the way, there's no such thing as a language teacher. There are only language learners. Um, that always gets pushback when I say that. You can't teach a language. You have to learn it. So you can train people in languages. As I mentioned, if you want someone to pass a test that's coming up, you might drill it into them in such a way that they'll do well on the test. But if you really want them to learn the language, they have to do it themselves. They can't go from the obvious over to the chaotic, which is what language learning is. It's really a chaotic process. It has to be made sense of on your own. So basically what a master learner has to do, if you consider yourself, I mean, obviously we're paid to be teachers, I don't object to that, but uh, to be a master learner, you need to model, demonstrate, reflect, um, what's the other one? <laughs> uh, reflect and practice, yeah, so we have to model, demonstrate, reflect, practice, like we're doing right now, we're all reflecting on these points uh, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate a way that you could uh, approach your classes. Sometimes we call this a flipped learning approach. I try to put things out front for people that they could reach it uh, before I actually present it. But basically, it's a percolative process. So now then, uh, I'm, I'm about to wind up here. Uh, for you, how can you get involved in COPs? So, I've put some links here. One of them is to Electronic Village Online. And uh, there is the wiki that I showed you, evosessions.pbworks.com. There's also a Facebook page, but it's not that active. But evosessions.pbworks.com is a good way if you want to learn more through a community practice. That is a good entry. EVO Minecraft MOOC, if you're interested in learning through EVO and learning about Minecraft or about gamification or what that feels like, there are links there. We have a Facebook group, which is quite active, and also a, a Minecraft uh, a, a wiki. Multiliteracies is not so active these days, but we do have the we have a Facebook group, which gets posts every now and then, and we have um, we have our wiki, which preserves the syllabus, and sometimes I even update it with books. I have something there called the Berry Book Berry Bush Bookstore, and um, I update it, so I try to keep things that you can, you can click on there and you can browse and you can download your own books. Um, learning Together, that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. We're in episode 5.6 right now, and it has a, a, a PB Works page where I sort of organize what's coming up, and then there's a blog, learningtogether.net, and a Facebook group, which also are very active. Webheads in Action uh, has also... Uh, uh, not only a Facebook group, but we also have Groups IO, which is a, a sort of a, a um, we call it a listserv. People email to it. Now then, uh, I was asked to address uh, blended and hybrid e-learning through engagement of communities of practice that was mentioned in some of the materials I was asked to address. So what I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think maybe, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, early May, I suppose, uh, I gave a talk on just that topic, and the talk, as all my talks are, is on YouTube. This one, I actually annotated a transcript of the video using its closed captions because I thought there were so many interesting points there. And um, you can listen to it. The, the, the black bar there is you can just listen if you want. Um, yeah, and you can find the slides, and you can find the write-up. Oh, the write-up actually is the annotated video. Anyway, uh, if you want to, if you're interested in that topic and want to learn more about it, 
this is the way I work. I put everything online that I possibly can. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I hit the video. No, stop, okay. <laughs> Uh, so this has been Communities of Practice for Teachers, from Webheads in Action to EVO Minecraft MOOC. You can find out more about me at learningtogether.net. And you can find the slides at this link. And I thank you very much for your, uh, for your having me. Am I still with you? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, once for helping to make our webinar so rewarding. I would like to ask a few of the questions by the participants. A couple of them are there in the chat box as well. Uh, Harshita, if you want to ask by yourself, it will be pretty good. Yeah, happy to take questions. I'm, actually, I'm here for as long as you want me. Uh, hi, uh, how are you doing? I'm fine. All right, so the question that I have uh oh, breaking up. Yeah, we lost her. So, you have an experience of 40 years. That's a very vast experience. Can you hear me? Okay, and I, I think I see your question. In your vast experience of 40 years, you must have come across a variety of changing yes. trends and modes exactly. in imparting education. Yes, of course. Uh, there should be some lows, uh, some loopholes. How did you deal with them? The one trend that you really prefer to impart and inculcate learning. I think I kind of covered that in my talk um, as I I think the, the there have been a lot of modes I, I'm a language teacher so people used to try to get people to memorize and repeat uh, so many techniques to try to get people to learn languages but I think the one that really works best for me maybe for other people but it has to be for people who really want to learn the language and that is you get immersed in the language um, and you find cognitive things to do. You find ways to focus on other things than just the language. And the language often follows from that. So we, we actually is that video that uh, I, um, the one I did for the classics at TESOL has, there's some material there where we also transcribed a conversation that we had uh, talking about what people learned from uh, being in Minecraft and the, the teachers in, are the people in Minecraft have children there and so just talking about the way the kids are learning and how it's not so obvious it's obvious once you get into it and do it but you really have to immerse yourself in whatever it is you're trying to learn uh, and you know so I, I suppose that's that's uh, my instinct is just to uh, to sit down and try to learn it, and then you find yourself places where you people will help you learn. People need to help you learn. So a community of practices where you go to get people to help you learn what you want to learn. A little difficult to convey that to a class of, say, teenage kids, uh, but you know uh, that's what the that's what the direction is. That's what you're trying to you're trying to model to your students. So that means that you, how you learn should be what they pick up, how they can learn. All right. Thanks. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one more question in the chat box that says about uh, how use of these tools will enhance quality in education. Quality in education. Well, um, so it depends. I mean, I've mentioned quite a lot of them. Um, Um, hard to answer in a sentence, but uh, I've left a lot of links that you can read about what books are good for, for example, if, if that's an approach you want to take. Um, you get, oh, it, it's in, uh, ineffable like anything else. If you really want to learn about MOOCs, you have to join one. Join, join in and see. Join the MOOC and see how you interact with the people uh, in the MOOC. And you could also kind of set up your classes uh, in ways that will emulate that. So you can get your students engaging with each other, uh, doing projects, uh, finding, uh, you know, not, not just following a top-down curriculum. Okay, now we're here, we need to do this. Okay, you stop doing that. Okay, you, you, and you do this. Um, I, that doesn't set well with me personally. I like to... Uh, 
to try to, you know, explore things myself. If that's, but it doesn't, you know, all, all people are individually different. But uh, that's, a, that's a very broad question, how the use of the tools will enhance quality in education. They will probably enhance the quality of some aspect of education. So it depends on what your metrics are. What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve just uh, great exam results? Is that your metric? Then in that case, you might not see the improvement in quality unless you get a good exam score. But um, to really uh, learn something, that's the real quality in education, and to want to learn it. So if you can get engaged students in, in that kind of dynamic where they want to learn things and then they, they can find ways to achieve what they want to learn. Okay, uh, there's uh, another question which says that are these tools effective in achieving inclusion in education? Ah, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, it was actually asked me in one of my, I don't know if you know Deborah Healy. She was the past president of TESOL. Um, she asked me that. Um, she, she asked me about Minecraft. She said, well, who's left behind? Hmm, okay, well, she was coming at it from a perspective. She was president of TESOL, so she had to be careful about including people. But um, certainly something like a MOOC approach well, to put that question on its head, what if you use a traditional approach? Are you achieving inclusion in education? Probably not. You know, it depends on the dynamic in the class, the personality of the teachers and the students. So the more you can give people options in pursuing their learning in a way that's fun for them, then the more you're by definition, making it more inclusive. So if you ask the question, well, do you lose people by teaching a certain way? If people don't like that uh, or they don't continue on the course of study because they got turned off to it, then that's not inclusion. So we're, we're looking for ways that uh, techniques, not just tools, but techniques that, uh, that will make learning more interesting, more challenging, create autonomous learners who can learn what they want to learn through your model. Okay, uh, we have a lot many teachers uh, who have no exposure to the video gaming and stuff like that. So how can we motivate them to use Minecraft for enhancing their skills? Well, the way we address that in the EVO Minecraft book, uh, we ask people to register for the course, maybe uh, 100 do. Um, we don't hear from half of those. And then the other, we're down to 50, okay, so we try to get uh, uh, these people into Minecraft with us. We try, we, they really have to come into Minecraft, you know. So it, it, in other words, if you're going to work with video games, you have to play them yourself. You have to find something that's, that's interesting. Minecraft, I think, is very interesting for a wide range of people, um, as opposed to just a video game which really, you know, um, I'm trying to think of uh, you know Angry Birds or something like that. That's not really going to have an educational purpose. But one that has an educational purpose, or that uh, engenders skills, creative thinking skills, um, math skills, language skills. So all of these these skills are part of Minecraft. Just as one example. And if you, if you want to see how that works, you really have to join us, or you have to join a community of practice. There are many communities of practice. But you have to get into a community of teachers. So if you know someone, even kids, well, I don't know, kids, they don't. You're really looking for something that will welcome you into its community. So we do have uh, people in our Minecraft MOOC, ch children and uh, adults who work together. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not something you can say, uh, you, you can't really ordain it for your school unless you have people who are, um, who do that uh, because they like it. So where it's, where it's effective, usually there are people who do fantastic things with it and then bring other people, other teachers on board and the students pressure the teachers to get involved and, um, 
you know, so it's hard to just answer that question uh, because you, it really involves getting into a community of practice, a community of learners, and around other people who want to learn things, and then experiencing uh, what you're trying to learn. So you can't really, if you don't play video games yourself, it's going to be hard for you to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> but there are all kinds of games. There's a lot of people like World of Warcraft. Um, so that one doesn't appeal to me so much, but um, there are uh, learning experiences based on World of Warcraft. So it appeals to some people. Try them and see. Ask yeah. your students what they're playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you again for helping us become more aware of web heads in action and electronic village online Minecraft MOOC and its effectiveness in learning language by collaborating with other teachers while playing the video games. It has given us new ways of learning language with practice in groups. We hope you will consent uh, to join and speak to us by visiting our university once the lockdown is completely lifted. So thank you all uh, participants for participating so well. This is Dr. Abha signing off on behalf of TD and Kaplan Academy. Stay tuned, stay connected, keep learning, keep creating, stay happy and stay blessed. Goodbye and take good care of yourselves. Thank you yes. very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, so thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having thank me. You, Appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. What a nice. What a nice. Um, you know, when I was doing some courses in Thailand, um, they always when I gave a course, the students would always, they, they would appoint one person to get up and speak about what they learned and and all the students were, oh, so polite. It's just amazing. You know, it's a good feeling when people yes. thank you for what you do. Yes, mm -hmm. very true. <laughs> Even the text of thank you is coming. Hmm, okay. Okay, well, anyway, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So I guess I'll go have my dinner. Yeah, yeah. Please carry okay. on. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you okay. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and when I get the recording, I'll post it on my learningtogether.net uh, website. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.